The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. Our narrator, Mr. Badger. There's no security or peace and tranquility except underground. And then, if your ideas get larger and you want to expand, why, a dig and a scrape and there you are. No builders, no tradesmen, no remarks passed on you by fellows looking over you all, and above all, no weather. The water rats. Believe me, my young friends, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Simply messing about. Look at Rat now. A couple of feet of flood water and he's got to move into hired lodgings. Uncomfortable, inconveniently situated and horribly expensive. Ah, now then. Ah, the best of animals. So simple, so good-natured, and so affectionate. Oh, Ratty, you are too kind. Perhaps he's not very clever. No. But we can't all be geniuses. And it may be that he is both boastful and conceited. But he has got some great qualities, has Toad. I say nothing against Toad Hall. Quite the best house in these parts, as a house. But supposing a fire breaks out, or windows get broken, where's Toad? No, up and out of doors is good enough to roam about and get one's living in, but underground to come back to at last. That's my idea of home. Here, here, underground. The mole. had been working very hard all the morning, spring cleaning his little home. First with brooms, then with dusters, then on ladders and steps and chairs with a brush and a pail of whitewash, till he had dust in his throat and eyes and splashes of whitewash all over his black fur and an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving in the air above and in the earth below and around him, penetrating even his dark and lowly little house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. It was small wonder then 
that he suddenly flung down his brush on the floor, said, Bother! And, Oh, blow! And also, Hands ring cleaning! And bolted out of the house without even waiting to put on his coat. Something up above was calling him imperiously, so he scraped and scratched and scrabbled and scrooged, working busily with his little paws and muttering to himself, Up we go! Up we go! Till at last, pop! His snout came out into the sunlight and he found himself rolling in the warm grass of a great meadow. He thought his happiness was complete when as he meandered aimlessly along, suddenly he stood by the edge of a full-fed river. Never in his life had he seen a river before. All was a shake and a shiver, glints and gleams and sparkles, rustle and swirl, chatter and bubble. The mole was bewitched, entranced, fascinated. As he sat on the grass and looked across the river, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye. Something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, winked at him, and so declared itself to be an eye. And a small face began gradually to grow up around it, like a frame round a picture. A brown little face with whiskers, a grave round face, small neat ears and thick silky hair. It was the water rat. Hello, Mole. Hello, Rat. Would you like to come over? Oh, very much. The rat sculled smartly across and made fast. Then he held up his forepaw as the Mole stepped gingerly down, and the Mole, to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated in the stern of a real boat. Oh, that... I've never been in a boat before in all my life. What? Good heavens. What have you been doing? Well... Look here, if you've nothing else on hand this morning, supposing we drop down the river together and have a long day of it? Oh, oh yes. Let's just start at once. What lies over there? That? Oh, that's just the wild wood. We don't go there very much. We river bankers. Aren't they... aren't they very nice people in there? Well, the squirrels are all right. And the rabbits, some of them. But rabbits are a mixed lot. And then there's Badger, of course. He lives right in the heart of it. Wouldn't live anywhere else either, if you paid him to do it. Dear old Badger. Nobody interferes with him. They'd better not. Ah, sensible rat. Why, who should interfere with him? Well, of course, there are others. Weasels, and stoats, and foxes, and so on. They're all right in a way, but they break out sometimes, there's no denying it. And then, well, you can't really trust them, and that's the fact. The rat brought the boat alongside the bank, made her fast, helped the still awkward mole safely ashore, and swung out the luncheon basket while his excited friend shook out the tablecloth and spread it, took out all the mysterious packets one by one and arranged their contents in due order. I say, what are you looking at? Oh, there, look, a streak of bubbles travelling along the surface of the water. <laughs> bubbles! A broad, glistening muzzle showed itself above the edge of the bank, and the otter hauled himself out and shook the water from his coat. Greedy beggars! 
why didn't you invite me, Ratty? It was an impromptu affair. My friend, Mr. Mole. Proud, I'm sure. Have a sandwich. Salmon. Excellent. Oh, but such a rumpus everywhere. All the world's out on the river today. Oh, yeah? Toad, for one. Brand new wager boat. New togs. New everything. Ah. Oh. Once it was nothing but sailing. Then he tired of that and took to punting. Last year it was houseboating. It's all the same. Whatever he takes up, he gets tired of it and starts on something fresh. Such a good fellow, too. But no stability, especially in a boat. Did I ever tell you that good story about Toad and the lock keeper? It happened this way. Toad? An errant mayfly swerved unsteadily athwart the current in the intoxicated fashion affected by young bloods of mayflies seeing life. A swirl of water and a cloop, and the mayfly was visible no more. Neither was the otter. But again, there was a streak of bubbles on the surface of the river. Oh. Come on, Molly. We'd best be getting back. The afternoon sun was getting low as the rat sculled gently homewards in a dreamy mood, murmuring poetry things over to himself and not paying much attention to Mole. Ratty, please, I want to row now. You'd better wait till you've had a few lessons. It's not as easy as it looks. But Mole's pride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He jumped up and seized the skull so suddenly that the rat fell backwards off his seat with his legs in the air. Stop it, you silly ass! You'll have us over! But I can do it! Well... Just watch me! No! Let go! No! Let me! No! Give me the oars! Sit down! For goodness sake! Oh, we did it! Oh, no! Look out, Mole! We're going! We're going to... How cold the water was, and how very wet it felt. How it sang in the Mole's ears as he went down, down, down. How bright and welcome the sun looked as he rose to the surface, coughing and spluttering. How black was his despair when he felt himself sinking again. Then, a firm paw gripped him by the back of his neck. It was the rat, and the mole could feel him laughing right down his arm and through his paw and so into his neck. <laughs> Up you come! Oh, Ratty, my generous friend, do please forgive me. Oh, that's all right, bless you. What's a little wet to a water rat? Don't you think any more about it. And look here, Mole. I really think you'd better come and stop with me for a little time. And I'll teach you to row and to swim. And you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us. What do you say? Oh. <laughs> well, that's settled then. This day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated Mole. Each of them longer and full of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He learned to swim and to row, and entered into the joy of running water. And with his ear to the reed stems, he caught at intervals something of what the wind went whispering so constantly among them. One day, rounding a bend in the river with Mole sculling strongly and Ratty settled comfortably in the stern, they came in sight of a handsome, dignified old house of mellowed red brick with well-kept lawns reaching down to the water's edge. Here we are, Mole. Toad Hall. They disembarked and strolled across the gay flower-decked lawns in search of Toad, whom they presently happened upon resting in a wicker garden chair with a preoccupied expression of face and a large map spread out on his knees. Hooray! Oh, this is splendid! How kind of you! I was just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once, whatever you were doing. I want you badly, both of you. Hello, Mr. Toad. Absolutely, follow me. He led the way to the stable yard, the rat following with a most mistrustful expression. And there, drawn out of the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan, shining with newness, painted a canary yellow picked out with green and red wheels. There you are. That's real life for you, embodied in that little cart. The open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling downs. 
Come inside and look at the arrangements. Planned them all myself, I did. The mole was tremendously interested and excited and followed him eagerly up the steps. The rat, sensible animal, only snorted and thrust his hands deep into his pockets, remaining where he was. Now, you dear good old ratty, don't begin talking in that stiff and sniffy sort of way. You surely don't mean to stick to your dull, fusty old river all your life and just live in a hole in a bank and boat? I want to show you the world! I'm going to make an animal of you, my boy! I don't care. I'm not coming, and that's flat. And I am going to stick to my old river and live in a hole and boat, as I've always done. And what's more, Mole's going to stick to me and do as I do. Aren't you, Mole? Well, of course I am. I'll, I'll always stick to you, Rat. All the same, it sounds as if it might have been, well, rather fun, you know. Ha <laughs> ha oh, no. To the open road! Giddy up, old grey horse! Rooster! Indeed you must! Oh, I prefer my pad. Nonsense! Get up there! Oh, I Look at that. say, so yeah. I take it all Isn't back. Marvelous. See for Marv. What do you think, Molly? You can see for Marv. Feel the wind, the wind in your hair. The wind in my fur. Wonderful! Suddenly, far behind them, they heard a faint warning hum, like the drone of a distant bee. Magnificent motor car, possessed all earth and air for the fraction of a second, flung an enveloping cloud of dust that blinded and enwrapped them utterly. No! Rearing, plunging, backing steadily in spite of all the mole's efforts at his head, the old horse drove the cart backwards towards the deep ditch at the side of the road. It wavered an instant, then there was a heart-rending crash, and the canary-coloured cart their pride and their joy lay on its side in the ditch, an irredeemable wreck. <coughs> you villains! You scoundrels! You highwaymen! You... you road hogs! I'll have the law of you! I'll report you! Toad sat straight down in the middle of the dusty road, his legs stretched out before him, and stared fixedly in the direction of the disappearing motor car. He breathed short. His face wore a placid, satisfied expression. And at intervals he faintly murmured, Poop, poop. Glorious, stirring sight. The poetry of motion. The only way to travel. Oh, bliss. Oh, poop, poop. Oh, my. Oh, stop being an ass, Toad. Nothing to be done, Mo. He is now possessed. He's got a new craze, and it always takes him that way. Oh, bother, Toad! I've done with him. The following evening, the Mole, who had risen late and taken things very easy all day, was sitting on the bank fishing when the Rat came strolling along to find him. Heard the news, Molly. There's nothing else being talked about all along the river bank. Toad went up to town by an early train this morning, and he has ordered a large and very expensive... Motor car. Winter had come. The Mole had a good deal of time on his hands, and one cold, still afternoon, he formed the resolution to go out by himself and explore the wild wood, and perhaps strike up an acquaintance with that thoroughly pleasant, if reclusive, character, Mr. Badger. Rat was dozing before the fire as Mole slipped out of the warm parlour into the open air. The country lay bare and entirely leafless around him, and he thought that he had never seen so far and so intimately into the insides of things as on that winter day when nature was deep in her annual slumber and seemed to have kicked the clothes off. 
With great cheerfulness of spirit, he pushed on towards the wild wood, which lay before him, low and threatening. The faces began. Every hole, far and near, and there were hundreds of them, seemed to possess its face, coming and going rapidly, all fixing on him glances of malice and hatred, all hard-eyed and evil and sharp. Then the voices began. As he halted in indecision, they broke out on either side and seemed to be caught up and passed on throughout the whole length of the wood to its farthest limit. dusk when the water rat reached the first fringe of trees and plunged without hesitation into the wood, looking anxiously on either side for any sign of his friend. Here and there, wicked little faces popped out of holes, but vanished immediately at sight of the valorous animal, his pistols and that great ugly cudgel in his grasp. So Ratty, hard-eyed and determined, made his way manfully through the length of the wood to its furthest edge. Molly. Oh, Rat. I've been so frightened you can't think. Oh, Mo. You really shouldn't have gone and done it. I did my best to keep you from it. We riverbankers, we hardly ever come here by ourselves. Oh, my. The Mole came and crouched beside him, and looking out, saw the wood that had been so dreadful to him in quite a changed aspect. Holes, hollows, pools, pitfalls and other black menaces to the wayfarer were vanishing fast and a delicate gleaming carpet of snow was springing up everywhere. Oh my! The worst of it is, I don't exactly know where we are. Now, while all this was going on up above, I was fast asleep, as is my wont at this time of year, until suddenly... Oh! 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 Badger, let us in, please. It's me, Rat, my friend Mole. We've lost our way in the snow. Whoa! Ratty, my dear little man. Come along in, both of you at once. Why, you must be perished. So, Ratty, tell us the news from your part of the world. How's old Toad going on? Ah, oh, from bad to worse. Another smash-up only last week, and a bad one. You see, he will insist on driving himself, and he's a hopelessly bad driver, and quite regardless of law and order. More pie, Mole? Oh, yes, please. Killed or ruined, it's got to be one of the two things sooner or later. Badger, we're his friends. Oughtn't we to do something? Now, look here. When once the year has really turned and the nights are shorter, we'll take Toad seriously in hand. We'll stand no nonsense whatever. We'll make him be a sensible Toad. Hear, hear. 
Well said, Mole. I, uh, I very much like your house, Mr. Badger. Once well underground, you know exactly where you are. Nothing can happen to you and nothing can get at you. My thoughts exactly. Come with me, Mole. I want to show you something. Crossing the hall, they passed down one of the principal tunnels, and the wavering light of a lantern gave glimpses on either side of rooms, both large and small, some mere cupboards, others nearly as broad and imposing as Toad's dining hall. The mole was staggered at the size, the extent of it, the pillars, the arches, the pavements. Long ago, on the spot where the wild wood waves now, there was a city. A city of people. Here, where we are standing, they lived and walked and talked and slept and carried on their business. They were a powerful people and rich and great builders. They built to last, for they thought their city would last forever. What happened to them? Who can tell? People come, they stay for a while, they flourish, they build, and they go. It is their way. But we remain. There were badgers here, I've been told, long before that same city ever came to be. We are an enduring lot, and we may move out for a time, but we wait and are patient, and back we come. And so it will ever be. The field mice. They go around carol singing regularly at this time of the year. They're quite an institution in these parts. In the forecourt, lit by the dim rays of a horn lantern, some eight or ten little field mice stood in a semicircle. Red worsted comforters round their throats, their forepaws thrust deep in their pockets, their feet jigging for warmth. bright morning in the early part of summer. The river had resumed its wonted banks and its accustomed pace, and a hot sun seemed to be pulling everything green and bushy and spiky up out of the earth. The hour has come. What hour? Whose hour, you mean? Toad's hour. The hour of Toad. This very morning, another new and exceptionally powerful motor car will arrive at Toad Hall on approval or return. We must be up and doing before it is too late. Right, you are. We'll rescue the poor, unhappy animal. We'll convert him. He'll be the most converted toad that ever was after we've done with him. Hello. Come on, you fellows. You're just in time to come with me for a jolly... To come for a jolly... What? For the... Take his arms, you two. Inside. I say, what do you think you're doing? Unhand me at once. 
You've often asked us three to come and stay with you, Toad, in this handsome house of yours. Well, now we're going to. But I... When we've converted you to a proper point of view, we may quit, but not before. Hey! Take him upstairs, you two, and lock him up in his bedroom, while we arrange matters between ourselves. What? No, I absolutely... What are you doing, Ratty? Mole, let go! Jump up. There's a good fellow. And don't lie moping there on a fine morning like this. Mole and Badger will be out till luncheon time, so you and I will spend a pleasant morning together, and I'll do my best to amuse you. Dear kind rat, how little you realise my condition, and how very far I am from jumping up now, if ever. But do not trouble about me. I hate being a burden to my friends, and I do not expect to be one much longer. You are indeed. But I tell you, I'd take any trouble on earth for you, if only you'd be a sensible animal. Oh, if I thought that, Ratty, then I would beg you for the last time, probably, to step round to the village as quickly as possible. Even now, it may be too late and fetch the doctor. A doctor? And by the way, while you're about it, I hate to give you additional trouble. Would you mind at the same time asking the lawyer to step up? It would be a convenience to me, and one must face disagreeable tasks at whatever cost to exhausted nature. A lawyer? Yes. Oh, Toadie. Of course, of course. I'll go straight away. Thank you. Toad, who had hopped lightly out of bed as soon as he heard the key turned in the lock, watched the water rat eagerly from the window till he disappeared down the carriage drive. Then, laughing heartily, he dressed as quickly as possible in the smartest suit he could lay hands on, filled his pockets with cash and scrambled out of the window. The world has held great heroes, as history books have showed, but never a name to go down to fame compared with that of Toad. The clever men at Oxford know all there is to be known, but they none of them know one half as much as intelligence. You did what? He did it awfully well. Violins and everything. He did you awfully well. You've been a bit of a duffer this time, Ratty. Two, two of all animals. He's got clear away for the time, that's certain. And the worst of it is, he'll be so conceited that he may commit any folly. Indeed, at that very moment, Toadie was standing in the courtyard of an inn, lost in contemplation of a very large, very shiny red motor car. I wonder, I wonder if this sort of car starts easily. To my mind, the only difficulty that presents itself in this otherwise very clear case is how we can possibly make it sufficiently hot for the incorrigible rogue and hardened ruffian whom we see carrying the dock before us. Let me see. He has been found guilty on the clearest evidence. First, of stealing a valuable motor car. Secondly, of driving to the public danger. And thirdly, of gross impertinence to the rural police. Clark, will you tell us, please, what is the very stiffest penalty we can impose for each of these offences? Twelve months for the theft. Mild. Three years for the furious driver. Lenient. And fifteen years for the chick. It was pretty bad sort of chick. Nineteen years first rate. It's around twenty years to be on the safe side. Capital. And mind, Toad, if you appear before us again upon any charge, whatever, we shall have to deal with you very seriously. Then the brutal minions of the law fell upon the hapless Toad and dragged him from the courthouse, shrieking, praying, protesting. Across the hollow-sounding drawbridge, under the frowning archway of the grim old castle, whose ancient towers soared high overhead. Till they reached the door of the grimmest dungeon that lay in the heart of the innermost keep. And there the great door clanged behind them, and Toad was a helpless prisoner in the stoutest castle in all the length and breadth of Merry England.
past ten o'clock at night. The sky still clung to and retained some lingering skirts of light from the departed summer's day. Mole lay stretched on the riverbank when the rat's light footfall was presently heard approaching over the parched grass. Mole, Otter's here. There's news. What is it? Little Portly is missing. What's your boy? My youngest. Oh, that child is always straying off and getting lost and turning up again. He's been gone for days. We've looked everywhere for him. He can swim, can't he? No, not very well yet. And then there's the weir. Ah. Anyway, will you chaps keep an eye out? I'm sure he's fine, but you can rely on us. If you hear anything, I'll be waiting at the ford tonight. He, uh, he always liked it there. Um, Ratty, right, it's 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 not the sort of night for bed, and daybreak is not so very far off. Just what I was thinking. Come on. They got the boat out, and the rat took the skulls, paddling with caution. The line of the horizon was clear and hard against the sky, and in one particular quarter, it showed black against a silvery, climbing phosphorescence that grew and grew. At last, over the rim of the waiting earth, the moon lifted with slow majesty till it swung clear of the horizon and rode off free of moorings. Once more, they began to see surfaces, meadows widespread, and quiet gardens, and the river itself from bank to bank, all softly disclosed, all washed clean of mystery and terror, all radiant again as by day, but with a difference that was tremendous. Do you hear it, Mo? Hear what? It's gone. No, there it is again. I can only hear the wind playing in the reeds and the willows. Row on, Mo. Row. The music and the call must be for us. Breathless and transfixed, the mole at last stopped rowing as the liquid run of that glad piping broke on him like a wave, caught him up, and possessed him utterly. He saw the tears on his comrades' cheeks and bowed his head and understood. For a space they hung there, brushed by the purple loose strife that fringed the bank. Then the clear, imperious summons that marched hand in hand with the intoxicating melody imposed its will on Mole, and mechanically he bent to his oars again. And the light grew steadily stronger, but no birds sang as they were wont to do at the approach of dawn. This is the place. In silence, they landed and pushed through the blossom and scented herbage and undergrowth that led up to the level ground. Oh, look, Rat! Look, do you see him? I see him. They saw him. Backward sweep of the curved horns gleaming in the growing daylight. The stern, hooked nose. Kindly eyes looking down on them humorously. The bearded mouth broke into a half smile at the corners, and nestling between his very hooves, sleeping soundly in entire peace and contentment, the little round, podgy, childish form of the baby otter. Rat, are you afraid? Of 
him. Never. Sudden and magnificent, the first rays of the sun shooting across the level water meadows took the animals full in the eyes and dazzled them. When they were able to look once more, the vision had vanished, and the air was full of the carol of birds that hailed the dawn. I beg your pardon, what, what did you say, Rat? I, I think I was only remarking that this was the right sort of place we should find him. And look, why there he is, the little fellow. Portly, wake up. As they drew near the familiar ford, the mole took the boat into the bank, and they lifted Portly out and set him on his legs on the towpath. Looking up the river, they could see Otter start up, tense and rigid, from out of the shallows where he crouched in dumb patience. Now, just a minute. Isn't this my story? Ah, uh, yes. You. Toad was running across country as hard as he could, scrambling through hedges, jumping ditches, pounding across fields, till he was breathless and weary. What? No, 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 no. Stop! 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 Thank goodness for that. What a racket. <laughs> but I was in prison. How on earth do I find myself running across country? You escaped. Did I? How marvellous. Now look here, Toad. I am telling this story. Yes, but... It's I... no good, Toad. You know well that your talk is all self-praise and, and, well, gross exaggeration and conceit and boasting and vanity. And gas. Yeah, but my dear Badger, and you too, Ratty, surely you must see that this is absurd. I have to tell the tale of my adventures because you fellows simply... Well, you weren't there, were you? Oh, I want to hear all about this. You must have contrived to escape, you clever, ingenious, intelligent toad. Don't you egg him on, Mole, when you know what he is. All right. You may tell your story, Toad, but you'll oblige me by making it as short and bereft of conceit as you possibly can. Why, of course, dear Padger. You wish it done, and it shall be done. Maestro! Ladies and gentlemen, the concise adventures of Mr. Toad. The Toad passed his days and nights for several weeks, refusing his meals or intermediate light refreshments. Gosh, that really is jolly beautiful violin. But the jailer had a daughter, a pleasant wench and good-natured, who assisted her father in the lighter duties of his post. Toad, just listen, please. I have an aunt who's a washerwoman. Oh, there, there. Think no more about it. I have several aunts who ought to be washerwomen. Do be quiet a minute, Toad. A few pounds wouldn't make any difference to you, and it would mean a lot to her. Now, I think if she were properly approached, or squared, I believe, is the word you animals use, you could come to some arrangement by which she would let you have her dress and bonnet and so on, and you could escape from the castle as the official washerwoman. You're very alike in many respects, particularly about the figure. We are not. There now, you're the very image of her. Only I'm sure you've never looked half so respectable in all your life before. Now, goodbye, Toad, and good luck. Go straight down the way you came up, and if anyone says anything to you, as they probably will, being but men, you can chaff back a bit, of course. But remember, you're a widow woman, quite alone in the world, with a character to lose. The washerwoman's squat figure in its familiar cotton print seemed a passport for every barred door and grim gateway. It seemed hours before he at last heard the wicked gate in the great outer door click behind him, felt the fresh air of the outer world upon his anxious brow, and knew that he was free! Mother, what's 
Mr. Trouble, you don't look particularly cheerful. Oh, Mr. Train Driver, sir, I'm a poor, unhappy washerwoman and I've lost all my money and I can't pay for a ticket and I must get home tonight somehow. Oh, dear, oh, dear. It's very strange. We're the last train running in this direction tonight. Yet I've got be sworn that I heard another following us. Oh. They're gaining on us fast, and the engine is crowded with the queerest lot of people. Woman, I seem to be. I am a toad, the well known and popular Mr. Toad, a landed proprietor. I have just escaped by my great daring and cleverness. And if those fellows on that engine recapture me, it'll be chains and bread and water and straw and misery once more for poor, unhappy, innocent toads. Tell me truthfully now, what were you put in prison for? I borrowed a motor car while the owners were at lunch. Well, now. I don't hold with cars, and I don't hold with being ordered about by a policeman when I'm on my own engine. So, a short way ahead of us is a long tunnel. When we are through, I'll shut off steam and put on brakes as hard as I can. And the moment it's safe to do so, you must jump and hide in the wood before they get through the tunnel and see you. Now mind and be ready to jump when I tell you. Ready? Toad awoke to find himself lying beside a canal, along which came plodding a solitary horse, stooping forward as if in anxious thought. With a pleasant swirl of quiet water at its blunt bow, the barge slid up alongside of him, its gaily painted gunwale level with the towing path, its sole occupant a big stout woman, wearing a linen sunbonnet, one brawny arm laid along the tiller. Toad all! Well, I'm going that way myself! This canal joins the river some miles further on a little above Toadall, and then it's an easy walk. You come along in the barge with me and I'll give you a lift. So, are you very fond of washing? I love it. Simply dote on it. Never so happy as when I've got both arms in the wash tub. Oh, what a bit of luck <laughs> meeting you. <laughs> Oh, this shirt is filthy. Ugh, ugh. Oh, God, I'll drop the soap. Yuck. Oh, look at my paws. They've got all wrinkly. <laughs> I've been watching you all the time. Pretty washerwoman you are. Never swashed so much as a dish clout in your life, old lay. You common low fat bargewoman. Oh, I would have you know that I am a toad. A very well-known, respected and distinguished toad. I may be under a bit of a cloud at present, but I will not be laughed at by a bargewoman. Why, so you are. A horrid, nasty, crawly toad. And in my nice, clean barge, too. Now that is a thing that I will not have. Here, want to sell that there horse of yours? What? Me sell this beautiful young horse of mine? Oh no, it's out of the question. Who's going to take the washing home to my customers every week? Besides, I'm too fond of him and he simply dotes on me. Try and love a donkey. Some people do. Bob a leg. A shilling a leg. Oh, four shillings. No, no, no. Six and six cash down, plus as much as I can eat out of that pot of yours and he's yours. No horse. Walked all day. So tired. Aha! A motor car! This is something I like.
Pike. I will hail them, my brothers of the wheel, pitch them a yarn of the sort that has been so successful hitherto. And perhaps with luck, it may even end up in my driving up to Toad Hall in a motor car. There'll be one in the eye for Badger. It's here! Suddenly the earth failed under his feet. He grasped at the air, and splash, he found himself head over ears in deep water, rapid water, the river that bore him along with a force he could not contend with. Out, you child! And here I am! Oh, thank you very much, Ratty. Wow, a pretty sight you do look, and no mistake. Oh, Ratty. You've no idea what I've been through. Yes, well, I've Imprisoned, got... escaped, tricked, and humbugged everybody. You must listen, Toadie, the Wildwooders. Wildwooders? What about them? Oh, Toadie. You haven't heard. Heard? Heard what? The Stoats and Weasels. They've been and taken Toad Hall. What? We'll see about that! Who comes there, friend or fan? Oh, stuff and nonsense. What do you mean by talking like that to me? Come out of that at once or I'll... Oh, oh. My turn. Come again soon. Missing you already. Now listen, Toad. While you were riding about the country in expensive motor cars and breakfasting on the fat of the land, Mole and Badger have been camping out in the open in every sort of weather, living very rough by day and lying very hard by night, watching over your house, scheming and planning how to get your property back for you. You don't deserve to have such true and loyal friends, Toad. You don't, really. I know. I'm an ungrateful beast. But listen, we have a plan. Badger. Now listen, my young friend. Your father was a particular friend of mine and told me a great deal he wouldn't have dreamt of telling you. Beneath Toad Hall, he discovered a passage and he showed it to me. Don't let my son know about it, he said. He's a good boy, but very light and volatile in character, and simply cannot hold his tongue. If he's ever in a real fix, and it will be of use to him, you may tell him about the secret passage, but not before. I say. Now, there's going to be a big banquet tonight. It's the Chief Weasel's birthday, and all the weasels will be gathered together in the dining hall, eating and drinking and laughing and carrying on, suspecting nothing. No guns, no swords, no sticks, no arms of any sort whatever. We shall creep out quietly into the butler's pantry with our pistols and swords and sticks. Got them all here. And rush in on them. And whack them, and whack them, and whack them. Ha ha! Right. Belt to go round each animal. Check. A sword to be stuck into each belt. A cutlass on the other side to balance it. Got him. Pair of pistols each. Policeman's truncheon. Handcuffs. Bandages. Sticking plaster. Flask. Sandwich case. Now then, follow me. Mole first. Rat next. Toad last. And mind you don't chatter so much, Toad, or you'll be sent back. Sure as fate. The badger led them along by the river for a little way and then suddenly swung himself over the edge into a hole in the riverbank a little above the water. It was cold and dark and damp and low and narrow, and poor Toad began to shiver, partly from dread of what might be before him. The lantern was far ahead and he could not help lagging behind a little in the darkness. Come on, Toad. The terror of being left behind in the darkness seized on Toad and he came on with such a rush that he upset the rat into the mole and the mole into the badger for a moment all was confusion. Ow! Oh, Ratty! We're under attack! Where are they? Let me at them! Oh, sorry, sorry, silly me. That's it! Back you go! But Toad whimpered and the other two promised that they would be answerable for his good conduct. And at last the badger was pacified and the procession moved on. The passage now began to slope upwards. They groped on a little further 
And then the noise broke out again, quite distinct this time. And very close above them, they heard raised voices and the stamping of little feet on the floor and the clinking of glasses as little fists pounded on the table. What a time they're having. Come on! The four of them put their shoulders to the trap door and heaved it back, hoisting each other up. They found themselves standing in the butler's pantry, with only a door between them and the banqueting hall where their unconscious enemies were carousing. Well, I do not propose to detain you much longer, but before I resume my seat, I should like to say one word about our kind host, Mr. Toad. <laughs> That's the chief weasel. We all know Toad. Good Toad. Modest Toad. Honest Toad. <laughs> Just let me get at him! Hold hard a minute. Get ready, all of you. Let me sing you a little song which I have composed on the subject of his soul. A toad went to victory, giving me down the street. <laughs> the hour has come. Follow me. <laughs> ah! The mighty badger, his whiskers bristling, his great cudgel whistling through the air. Mole, black and grim, brandishing his stick, the shout of his awful war cry. <laughs> oh no you don't! Yeah! <laughs> Tony went a pleasuring! I'll pleasure up! <laughs> We were but four in all, but to the panic-stricken weasels the hall seemed full of monstrous animals, grey, black, brown and yellow, whooping and flourishing enormous cudgels. And they broke and fled with squeals of terror and dismay, this way and that, through the windows, up the chimney, anywhere to get out of reach of those terrible sticks. Direction. The four animals settled down again to peaceful, tranquil lives. Toad, we really ought to have a banquet at once to celebrate this affair. Oh, jolly good! Food, drink, celebration, speeches! No speeches. Songs! No songs! But I planned it all. My, my disquisition on our prison system, the, the waterways of old England. Mayn't I even sing them one little song? No! no. Very well, my good and loyal friends. I ask merely leave to blossom and expand for yet one more evening to let myself go and hear the tumultuous applause that always seems to me somehow to bring out my best qualities. However, you are right, I know. Henceforth, I will be a very different toad. Badger, I feel like a brute. I know. But the thing had to be done. Toad had retired to his bedroom, melancholy and thoughtful. His brow resting on his paw, he pondered long and deeply. Gradually, his countenance cleared and he began to smile long, slow smiles. At last he got up, locked the door, drew the curtains across the windows, collected all the chairs in the room and arranged them in a semicircle, then sang to the enraptured audience that his imagination so clearly saw. When the toad came home Panic in the parlours and howling in the halls. There was crying in the cowsheds and shrieking in the stalls. When the toad came home. 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 There was 
smashing in of window and crashing in of door. There was chivying of weasels that fainted on the floor when the toad came home. When the toad came home. Oh, when the toad came home. In the course of long summer evenings, the friends would take a stroll together in the wild wood, now successfully tamed so far as they were concerned, and it was pleasing to see how respectfully they were greeted by the inhabitants, and how the mother weasels would bring their young ones to the mouths of their holes and say, pointing, Look, baby, there goes the great Mr. Toad, and that's the gallant water rat, a terrible fighter walking along a him. And yonder comes the famous Mr. Mole, of whom you so often have heard your father tell. But when their infants were fractious and quite beyond control, they would quiet them by telling them how, if they didn't hush them and not fret them, the terrible grey badger would up and get them. This was a base liable on badger, who though he cared little about society, was rather fond of children, but it never failed to have its full effect. In the Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. Toad was played by Stephen Mangan. Mole by Claire Skinner. Badger by Philip Jackson. And Rat by Carl Prekop. Otter was played by Patrick Brennan. The Bargy by Liza Sadovy. The Judge by Paul Stonehouse. And The Girl by Stephanie Racine. The director was David Hunter. The producer, Anne Mackay. And the production coordinator, Selina Ream. The BBC Symphony Orchestra, leader Stephen Bryant, was conducted by Timothy Brock, who orchestrated the music. The singers were Genevieve Hamilton, Amanda Morrison, Julia Bachelor-Walsh, Jonathan English, Daniel Ockenloss and William Gaunt. Sound was by Neil Pemberton, Adele Conlin, Christopher Rouse, Martha Littlehales and Colin Guthrie. Adapted and composed by Neil Brand. The Wind in the Willows is a co-production between Radio 4 and Radio 3.